Um, thank you so much for inviting me. This is a great opportunity for me to talk about this uh, things that we have been doing in Norway. Um, I've taken the liberty to put in a question mark. I do not intend to know everything on this uh, subject. Anyway, uh, first of all, conflicts of interest. I did institute the lateral trauma position that I'm going to talk about later. Am I clipping? Do you hear me? Fine? Okay. Uh, but I can tell you, I did, did not have any economical benefits thereof. Uh, my take on this was uh, during my time as a, a HEMS doctor, at the same time being uh, the um, medical director of our uh, regional emergency EMS service. Uh, I could then come to patients uh, that were strapped on their back, unconscious trauma patients, uh, and I can tell you my or our uh, EMTs and uh, paramedics are not allowed to do uh, RSIs, uh, intubate a patient. <laughs> the backbenchers, <laughs> thank you, Thomas. <laughs> uh, and then w when you come to a patient like this, uh, 30 minutes uh, after uh, trauma uh, and they're unconscious on their back and you start doing your RSI and then you realize there's blood in there or there's other kind of goo uh, which is probably not a good idea so we started thinking we have to do something about this then again uh, we had we realized that in Norway we had a practice from strict ATLS PHTLS protocols uh, really yes sir, no sir, uh, plus plastic, you know, the yellow plastic thing, to almost nihilistic, we don't need really uh, colors and stuff like that. So uh, two governmental um, bodies asked us to, to do a uh, evidence-based process to find out, guys, what is good and what is bad for the patients. So we started out. And um, you might know this guy. He's actually the backbencher over there, Daniel was also the, here somewhere. Someone told me that he was uh, the, the guy that he, he actually had his legs on. I don't think so. But anyway, uh, and a neurosurgeon, ATLS boss, uh, paramedic, uh, uh, and instructor in, in, in university, and a me methods expert. And me taking the photo, trying to get these very, very different views on board to one uh, standard uh, operating proce procedure for Norway. Okay, um, I think this uh, article, th this is the summary in English. Uh, it's supposed to be on a web page or something. If not, uh, you can just ask me because it's actually uh, open access. So you get my email in the end here. I'm going to talk, talk you through some of that and some of my own uh, stuff. First, if you make a guideline uh, on uh, beta blockers, you would have a huge amount of data and you can pull it into very nice uh, uh, meta analysis and stuff like that. As you probably know, that is not normally not the case. I, I'm not clipping? No. Don't touch it. No, I'm, n I'm, not, I'm not touching it <laughs> as long as you hear me. Okay, good. Uh, uh, it's really not a lot of. Uh, evidence normally out there when we talk about uh, the pre-hospital uh, care. Uh, and what do we do then when there's little evidence? Should we say like Cochrane style, sorry Cochrane? Uh, no, there's no evidence so we can't say anything. Or should we like, you know, Gobsat, the method, v very well-known method of, of doing guidelines, Gobsat, good old boys sitting around the table deciding uh, not very uh, normally, not very uh, evidence-based, but or you could actually do something in between. We, you could say this we actually have quite uh, good evidence on, or we can say um, this we do not really know all about, but 
uh, we think that this might be reasonable and be transparent and honest about it. So I think that's the middle way we chose for our, our guideline. And then again, it's about balancing, of course, sounds like easy, but you really have to take into con consideration both benefit and harm. And it goes without saying, benefit should outweigh harm. Um, and then it's the issue about frequency uh, versus consequence. It's called risk management. Some of you probably quite known to this. Uh, this uh, the yellow, yellowy thing here uh, would indicate a not so frequent occurrence. Uh, could be really serious. And the red one would be more frequent and much more dangerous or per perhaps fatal. So if we take that into our what we're talking about, this is a traumatic brain injury. It's the main killer in Norway. It's like in, in trauma, like two thirds of patients die from this. And it's also the biggest maimer. Um, so this is high occurrence and uh, high consequence for the patient. This one is devastating for the patient and the family, but it occurs much less often. So you probably already found out what I'm going to say. These are the two. And if you have to, and I say if, but I don't, because I don't think you really have to weigh these too much together uh, or uh, balance, uh, balance this balancing these two uh, considerations. Um, but if you have to, I would say, if I'm there, please rescue me and forget about this one for the moment. And actually, there are studies saying that uh, quadriplegic patients also say the same, so it's not something that I found out. So what do we know then? Um, well, first of all, kind of historical fact. 1957, NATO war surgery, emergency war surgery handbook. This is called the NATO position. This was the way to do it in 1957. Cool. Okay. Then came along a series of uh, more or less, I would say, groundless uh, article studies. One of them I'm going to, to, to write to read to you. The para paralysis occurred in each case as a consequence of failure to recognize the injury to the spinal column and to protect the patient from the consequence of his unstable spine. There was really no data to back this up and it became a truth without evidence and that's what I call a dogma. Could be right, could be wrong, but it's, it's very strong, especially in American medicine, it's very strong. And we have adapted a lot of it. And I'm, I'm going to tell you that one of my biggest fears is that the third world countries will look to series like ER and stuff like that and say, okay, what we need for these patients are yellow plastic things that we can strap them on. I think actually, I think they're better off in the back of a lorry on their side. Okay, I'll come to that. So what do we know about the benefit of this? Well, some of you probably know this quite famous or someone would say infamous uh, study uh, from um, Mark Hausfeld and colleagues. In some of you know this study? Hands up. Yeah, a couple of guys. Good, thank you. Um, three of you. Uh, well, the, the point being, they did a, a chart review, a retrospectal, uh, perhaps not the best method, but okay. Here is Albuquerque, New Mexico, level one trauma center, and every, I mean every trauma patient would be on this plastic thing, strapped in all fashions. And then again, you had Kuala Lumpur, nice, good, level one trauma center, but no, I mean no EMS, no ambulance service. No one had seen a patient coming in with a collar. And so they, they looked at how, um, how, did, how did it go with this uh, um, spinal injured patient. And if any difference at all, 
it was actually better in Kuala Lumpur. Lot about, lot to say about a study like that, but but it's to my knowledge, it's actually one of the very few, or perhaps the only one that's looking into it that way. Okay. Much newer from Norway. This is a, a bunch of um, neurosurgeons and hemp doctors in the western part of Norway, Bergen. They compiled a what I would say a very comprehensive, perhaps not very systematic review, but very, it's really comprehensive. And one of their conclusions is this. So they actually stopped using a collar on a regular basis, mostly for extraction, which I think is a good idea. So, then again, this is a, uh, from 2015, I think, uh, medical, medical legal cases uh, from UK. I mean, court cases or cases that could go to court. Uh, and they said in their um, conclusion that uh, the 23 patients were suffering from problems because someone had not put uh, them into spinal immobilization or removed it too fast. Reading it several times, I still cannot find out how they came to that conclusion, but probably it's kind of got that uh, method in here. Okay, so do we know that there's harm here? Yes, we do. You know the combative patients, everyone who has put the patient on the, on the backboard uh, knows that uh, there are combative patients, but uh, perhaps the main problem here is, could be from uh, one of this, the Cochrane reviews. Uh, it's not a very new one. I think it's 2009, so it's, it's getting old now. But uh, they said they didn't find any benefit, but they issued this warning. And I, I would say yes, probably. Uh, I can go along with that. So, in my studies, I've looked into this, this, this question. Is supine lying on your back dangerous? Since the days of a European in uh, the USA, Peter Safar um, said that um, we need to, to uh, reposition our patients that are, are unconscious but breathing. In Europe, this has been the truth, the dogma, since 1960s or 70s. We always do that. So, but do we know? Is it, is it really dangerous? So I, 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 I'll cut this story very short because it's a lot of work, but the, the short answer is yes, there's ample evidence that the supine position is dangerous compared to the lateral position. And then we're not taking uh, aspiration or blood or other goo into consideration. So then again, we're turning patients out there. We do. Uh, we do it for a simple log roll. Is that in dangerous? Again, a, we did a, a um, systematic, re systematic review, uh, and we didn't find any evidence. That does not mean that there are no evidence, or it's actually that it's totally safe. But as far as we can say, uh, log rolls are okay, and the lateral, tra lateral trauma position is probably also okay. So, and here it goes. This is the Norwegian thing. Um, this is the way we transport pa patients when they are unconscious of the trauma, uh, unintubated, of course. Is it transported like that? Some of my work I've done in, in a amazing group in, in um, Tampa. Well, they're from all over the US, but th this is the lab in Tampa, Florida. Um, and one of the things I wanted to see, look at was, uh, and this is a neck. It's a total disruption. We made a total disruption. It's total unstable cervical spine and put sensors on, on top and below. It's, it's cadavers, of course. 
I didn't have to say that. Okay, you knew already. Um, and um, what we found out was, was that the motion induced during a log roll, standard log roll, and the lateral thrown position were comparable. They were comparable. So, is there any harm from this specific device? We know that it doesn't really work very well. It doesn't really uh, stabilize the patient. Everyone who has sit beside a patient in the car ambulance would see that if you strap the patient uh, so the patient still can breathe, there would, would be some motion. And there, there's, there's some, uh, some evidence also out there. But um, pain um, and combative patients and ulcers. Uh, this is, of course, n equals one. It's a, it's a, a n equals one study. But this is a elderly patient, transported uh, on his uh, yellow backboard for two hours, staying in the ER. He died eventually from his sepsis, from this hideous uh, uh, pressure ulcer, and he had no spinal injury. Okay, about this one then. Uh, it does work. It does keep you from nodding. It actually doesn't keep you very much from turning your head. But is it harmful? Because that has been the idea. We don't know if it works really, but it's okay as long as it doesn't harm the patient. But it does harm. Uh, you've seen it. Combative patients, you've seen them with, with starting ulcers. Uh, but the, there are also a few studies indicating that they would, might raise the intracranial pressure. And there's a much debate, is that actually, uh, is it important? Uh, is it cl clinically relevant? Uh, some say that if you're in the end of the curve here, it probably could be. And, you know, you can try put on your collar yourself, and if, you, if it's really like this, your, your veins are starting bulging. So, it might be intuitive as well. Okay, penetrating, penetrating trauma, we, we all agree. Uh, there's a lot of studies, so with those guys, we are not going to uh, stabilize or immobilize uh, spinal-wise. Clinical clearance protocol, yes, we, we tossed in a clinical clearance protocol for the EMTs and the paramedics to use out there. It's a, it's a nexus protocol, really. So, how are we going? It's because some patients are going to be, be put on uh, in spinal precautions, spinal uh, motion restriction, or whatever you call it. Uh, do not transport on this one. This one is better. We actually did a study on that, finding out in the same cadaver lab. Uh, yes, it works. It works better than a backboard alone. Um, and this is this is a, a fun study from home. Um, we put uh, um, a, a phantom into one of uh, a row of all these uh, devices and find out found out that it's actually going to make excellent CT scans, some of them anyway. So you can actually use it all through CT, which especially this one actually. Yes, you can use a normal stretcher with the belts and perhaps a, uh, they call it a P PTLS uh, kind of roll of blankets. I would say no to this one, the scoop stretcher. Uh, it's hard and it's slippery, and but for very short transports, perhaps. This is a nice article. Uh, I'm not going to go to into into details, but just uh, the, the, this is one of the um, uh, things they're saying here. There were no negative clinical outcomes in their material. Okay. Good. So back to the guidelines. Uh, we put a uh, critical injury decision point in this uh, algorithm. And, and this is perhaps the leap of faith 
CobSat, uh, whatever moment in our um, our thing, because we are act actually extrapolating from the penetrating trauma population, bleeding population, and saying if you really have a critically injured patient, do not stop to do all this. Uh, um, formal uh, spinal precaution uh, protocols. That doesn't mean that you get the patient and and chuck him in the back of your car. It's you can still do careful handling, but um, you should not delay transport. So this is one of the f a few of the triggers, but it's also uh, very much up to the to the clinician on site to decide. So. If there's, if you decide it's, it's a critical injury, do not delay transportation. Uh, if the pa patient is um, unconscious or like one of us saw a month ago, the whole chin was, uh, well, it was parted and bleeding. And of course that patient needs to be transported even though conscious on her side in this case. And then there's the nexus uh, thing. If you're okay, everything is negative. Uh, sorry, if one of these is positive, then you go for spinal stabilization. Uh, if they're no to all, can you see this? Yeah. If there's no to all, no spinal uh, immobilization or stabilization, and as we talked about, the isolated penetrating trauma, no spinal stabilization. And this is the story about the patient uh, from a car accident walking out of his own car and said, okay, I have a pain in my back. Say, the, the police would say, okay, you can, you can sit in our car. Sitting there and then comes along the fire brigade and <laughs> takes the roof off uh, to get this guy out. He walked from his own car to the police car and they, well, I think Hampshire police is not very, well, they, 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 they lost a good car that day. Anyway, uh, so we're, like the British, now saying it's okay to invite uh, even car crashians uh, out of the wreck, even though they might, if, if they want to themselves. If they're able to, they can, even if they have a neck pain, for instance, they can walk to the stretcher, sit down and be cleared or got getting some a vacuum mattress, for instance. So, to sum it all up, um, if the patient is critical, we put our emphasis on A, B, and C, and not D, and time to get the patient to hospital. Supine position in dangerous, is dangerous in unconscious patients when they're not intubated. The LTP is probably okay, and you should be applied in these patients. Yes, do a clinical clearance protocol. Vacuum mattress is preferable. And we can invite patient to self-extract. And um, when putting on a collar, don't do it like this. Thank you.